Okay, welcome back everybody and um, thank you Fred, uh, Bob and Tom for the, the previous session. We are really, really passionate about doubles golf and junior golf leagues and um, excited to be taking them forward. Sorry to have rushed you Fred, but uh, we don't have a lot of leeway in our, in our schedule. Um, gives me great pleasure to host this panel. Uh, it's actually nice to see people on the screen rather than just speaking to the screen. So I'm delighted to be joined by uh, a few leaders in the sport. Um, the diversity and inclusion panel. We do have Susie Whaley, the uh, honorary president of the PGA of America, a, a master PGA professional, a director of instruction at uh, the country club at Mirasol. Um, but unfortunately, she's in the background somewhere. Apology, and I'm hopefully says very shortly um, throughout this. I'd also like to welcome a, another. Um, PGA Master Professional, uh, a face familiar to anybody who's attended previous uh, annual congresses, uh, and probably even if you haven't, he's probably still familiar to you. So, uh, Tony Bennett, President of Edgar and Head of Diversity and Inclusion at the IGF. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also have the CEO of the PGA of Canada, who've embarked upon a uh, a new task force this year, uh, Mr. Kevin Thistle. I know it's early there, Kevin, so thank you for joining us. No worries. <laughs> and, uh, and Jackie Davidson, the Assistant Director, Golf Development at the R&A, and really the lady who spearheaded much of the Women in Golf Charter. So, uh, Jackie, a bit more sensible time for you, and, and thank you for joining us as well. We're delighted to be here. So what I'm, what we re the aim of this, uh, the aim of this session really is to, we talked a lot about diversity and inclusion, uh, and obviously it's a hot topic in so many ways. And I guess what I really want to get out of this session is how can we take, and how can our audience really take practical steps, and uh, and create tools that will, will really make a difference. How can they really get started? what might be the barriers to, to get started in the area of, you know, to encourage greater diversity and inclusion in the game, in their countries, in the memberships and the workforce, and obviously in the organizations themselves. You know, what barriers do we need to continue to remove, no matter of gender, race, disability? That's the, the really key. Ah, Susie. <laughs> Susie, thank you for joining us. We know it's early there. Can you hear us okay? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Thank Great. you. And I have, I have introduced you, so uh, Excellent. who you are. <laughs> I think they already did, but thanks so much for joining us. Um, so I'm going to start with the, with the first subject, really, um, gender. And, um, you know, we, we were quickly signed up to the Women in Golf Charter and we've encouraged our PGAs to. And um, I think we've started from a pretty low base in many cases, you know, but we started and we, we started benchmarking uh, our PGA memberships uh, about 10 years ago, and they're slowly increasing. I think we've got an average now of about eight to 9% female PGA members across our membership. When we started, it was about 6%. So we've started and, we, and we're improving. Okay, I'll transfer to you, Susie, then, earlier than anticipated. But obviously, um, obviously you've been a trailblazer for, for women's yeah. golf. Um, first female you know, back in 2003 to qualify for a PGA Tour event. And then, and then in many ways, uh, since then, obviously, as the first president of the, the PGA of America. Have there been barriers in place? And how have you overcome them you know, in, in achieving what you have? Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. Happy holidays to those that are celebrating today. But, uh, you know, and obviously I hope everybody's staying safe and well. I know we're all going through a very strange time, but grateful for golf and, and grateful for the fact that we can get people outside playing the game amongst all of us that are PGA. But like you, uh, it's no different here in the States. We've struggled. It's been a challenge. Um, we separate our inclusion into four buckets. Um, we really feel that when you lead with inclusion, a diversity follows. And so since 2015, really put intentional practices in place, not only to grow uh, women within our workforce, but obviously within our consumer engagement, within our vendor inclusion, 
Um, and we've done it through education and learning, and we've put processes in place in hopes that we don't have this conversation again in 10 more years' time. It's not because those that have come before us haven't tried uh, to grow the gender bias uh, within our game and within the industry, um, but we really felt it was important that we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, meaning um, we started to support initiatives to grow women's golf. We have around 1,300 uh, female PGA professionals who are Class A professionals in the United States. Um, if you look at our numbers, uh, that's very low, and uh, we're looking, obviously, to grow that. We've started a recruiting program amongst our college system, our Division One, Two, and Three collegiate athletes and our NAIA collegiate athletes. Um, but we're also doing it through uh, our minority uh, focus, which is uh, within our PGA Reach Foundation. So um, each and every PGA professional uh, we're offering education to to help grow that. Uh, we do it through programs like you talked about in the previous session, like doubles golf, PGA Junior League golf. And our hopes is in starting at the junior level, obviously without ignoring those that are older than that, um, that we'll develop a culture of inclusion where boys and girls play golf together for a lifetime um, without any gender bias, without any cultural background bias, without any sexual orientation bias. And um, we're looking to include all. And so our programming is just that, that we want golf to be for everyone. Awesome. Yeah, and, and obviously um, you've also, as an industry in the States, really got behind the LPGA Girls Golf, which seems to be making a, a massive impact as well. Yes, it is. And, and you know that we have PGA professionals that coach LPGA Girls Golf programs. We have LPGA professionals and um, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, the LPGA also has a teaching and club professional division, which I'm also a member of. Um, they have about 1,800 uh, women that are part of that organization. About 230 of us are dual members. I also have an international component to that, but there are up to 800,000 uh, young girls playing uh, LPGA girls golf, which is exciting. PJ Junior League golf, as you already talked about early, in an earlier session, it is growing the game. Um, in a large way, but certainly we want to see that grow globally uh, and worldwide. But in the United States alone, um, if there's any good, which I hesitate to say, being respectful to those who have suffered or families who have suffered traumatically from COVID, um, we are up almost a half a million junior golfers in the States uh, since May, since we got back to the game really uh, because there's no other sports being offered in the United States in a team format currently at this time. And many uh, young families wanted their children outside, wanted their children walking, wanted their children exposed uh, to a sport, and they took up the game, which is exciting. I think on the other end of this, where all of us have to work extremely hard is how to re retain those youth and uh, those adults that have come to us which we're grateful for, uh, but how do we keep them involved and in the game in a fun, exciting, fast way that golf is now being played in the States? It's much quicker. We have one rider cars. Uh, we're allowing juniors to participate at, at every time and all times. Um, we have PJ Junior League running uh, during COVID. We have LPJ Goals Golf running during COVID. Thankfully, we don't have any cases uh, that are related back to either of those entities, which is exciting, but a real credit to the PGA professionals delivering those programs responsibly. Sure. But I think that's where we really have to turn. How, how do we continue uh, to grow girls golf? How do we continue to grow uh, minority golf? How do we continue to keep those that have just taken up the game, who are obviously from different parts of the country, which makes them diverse, um, involved in the game? And I think together, when we do that as an entity globally, um, we'll see the benefits for all of our members. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And we're seeing that in the, right across our, our membership is uh, uh, it is a little shift now. And it's a positive shift, as you say, despite the, the obvious challenges to all of us of COVID that, um, you know, it is retaining these people now. It's continuing to make uh, continuing to make golf interesting and exciting for them. But uh, we're going to shift over to, to you, Tony, because um, I remember, you know, many years ago now, you and as chatting about you becoming as a volunteer president of Edgar, and I could see then the passion that you had for that, and obviously it's now become your career, and obviously you've taken it forward even more. 
So shifting a little bit onto, you know, I guess your area of expertise, although you're an expert right across the development of the game. But golfers yeah. with disabilities, then just share a little bit of the, the initial work that you did with Edgar to where you are now. Well, I think first and foremost, thanks to you, Ian, and to the board, because you allowed me to do that in my free, in my free time. No conflict of interest. And so it was a really good opportunity to get involved in an area that I'm not going to say I was particularly passionate about. And, and, and it sounds really bad when I say that. I'm not passionate about it today either. What I am is there's a very much a purpose behind what I do. In that I kind of looked at it and went, there's a whole group of people here that are being ignored. This group of people here are kind of sort of in a secondary world. And it, it shouldn't be like that. It should just be part of the community. And so if we look at our normal communities, and this was probably the first thing that we did, we looked at the normal community of, of people that's within a 25 mile radius of pretty much every golf course. And 15% of that, that community, most likely 15, 12 to 15% of that community is probably going to be disabled. And yet then when you look in a golf club, you found maybe one or two members. And so obviously there was an imbalance. It didn't, it didn't kind of work out quite the way it should. I think the second thing that we looked at was that you know, golf itself is potentially the most inclusive game of all. Because unlike some of the other sports that people with disability play, where they play a separate game, so for example, wheelchair rugby, you play wheelchair rugby, wheelchair tennis, you play wheelchair tennis, you don't play tennis, you play wheelchair tennis. And so the days of the opportunity for, you know, a Roger Federer and a wheelchair tennis player to play together, it's not going to happen unless Roger Federer gets in a wheelchair. And so we have that opportunity where we have all possibilities for people with, dis with different disabilities, be that physical, intellectual, uh, sensory disability. Everybody can play together, same golf course, use the handicap system. That's all good. So I think what I also found was there's a certain amount of unconscious bias that was around. And that's not any kind of intent on the behalf of the person that has that bias. That intent is that, that that unconscious bias means that oftentimes when we look at somebody with a disability, and certainly I didn't know anything about it. I was very much an outsider to disability in 2013. I didn't really know too much. But when you look, you, you kind of look and say, well, you know, can this person pay? And it sounds terrible, but it's absolutely the truth. That's what many clubs said, and that's what many professionals looked at and said, well, you know, can do we have to give this away? Do we have to give the game away? And the answer, of course, is not, because, you know, when we look at the, the normal demographic that plays golf, then you've got a very small percentage of the population that plays, and they already have kind of, if you like, one of better descri description, um, they've pre-qualified themselves to be able to play the game. They've got the time, they've got access to be able to play the game, they've got a certain amount of funds to be able to play, and they've got an interest to play. And of course, if we have a similar kind of percentage of, of people that play with a disability, then they also have pre-qualified themselves as well. So I, I think what I found was that there was just a lot of unconscious bias and a lack of understanding that this is a big group of people that have already expressed an interest. All the research tells us that there's a, this group of people want more sport in their life and golf is probably the perfect vehicle for it. Yeah, and interesting, and that's been one of the things you've, you've shown us is you've brought it into the mainstream. So rather than treating golf, golfers with disability as separate, you've brought them into, into the federations, you've worked with the EGA, you've worked with others. We've had um, people play in European tour events now. And has that been a big push? Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, there was kind of three things that we had to do. We, we had the first thing, we had to raise awareness so people could kind of understand that you know, these people are out there and they want to play and they're just as good a golfers. And in fact, some of our players are seriously good players. You know, I've played with quite a lot of them and, you know, they turn me over quite easily sometimes. Okay, I'm not quite as good as I used to be, but, you know, they're, they're good players. There's some real good players there. I think, secondly, we had to understand that there's a massive participation opportunity here for golf. So if we were to take half of the penetration that golf has got into the, the worldwide population, just half of that, that, that penetration percentage and put it into the number of people with disability, you'd be talking about an extra 6 million golfers around the world. 
And that's a, that's a big number, and that's a lot of people that are buying clubs and buying shoes and buying golf balls and taking golf lessons and beers and burgers and club memberships. And then, of course, the third part was, yeah, get, get people on the big stage. So, you know, our friends down in, in Golf Australia did a fantastic job getting the All Abilities Championship up and running. I know Keith's going to be speaking in a few minutes from the European Tour. Keith was, you know, very much at the forefront of making sure that we got uh, golfers with disability on Europe in European Tour events. Uh, but we also had a, a demonstration event at the Solheim Cup, at the President's Cup. And, you know, this is a, a, these are massive audiences for people to see that golfers with disability not only can play the game, some of them can play it incredibly well. Yeah, no, totally. And, and economic reasons as well as moral reasons for, for doing the right thing, which is, which is great. I turn to you, Kevin, um, get you involved. Um, I know you're an example of a PGA just this this year taking really positive steps with the formation of your uh, of your task force Do you want to just give us a, an overview of your thoughts yeah i really think that with, with everything that's going on with the world and even black lives matter bringing a lens to a lot more things that you know we thought uh, as a group it was my team we came up with that silence, silence is not an option you know as leaders in the golf industry we had a responsibility to our members and the golf public to stand up against you know racism and injustice sort of thing you know and golf it's so powerful especially this year like susie said and susie i apologize we missed you in connecticut in october so would have loved to see you there but really you know we're committed to being part of the conversation you know we're going to change our policies we're going to look at procedures we want a result of state sport for everybody enjoyment for everyone you know we want to create out outlets where our stakeholders our professionals our players they can reach out if they're facing discriminatory experiences because really before this year no system existed like that we're going to recommend to our zones which are like our chapters that we adopt new policies and procedures we also going to have an intentional and active recruitment plan which we're working on right now for the golf industry we want to increase you know the diversity in perspective in the game and really a marketing plan on allyship if i can say one thing to maybe you know there's a lot of things that go into the task force or those sort of things you know um we've identified certain areas you know like um players of all abilities and that's what i like to call it sort of swimmer you know Tony, etc but the one thing that i learned about allyship and and if, if you take one thing away from me today is that about allyship when you're dealing you know with diversity and inclusiveness it's not self-defined i can't define it we can't define it our work has to be recognized by those we're trying to ally with. So if you're trying to help someone, it doesn't matter what, BIPOC, um, disabled, whatever, it's not, we don't get to define it. We must align with their thoughts. So you gotta take the time. Is this golf course too tough? Is this golf course set up? Can we include you? What's wrong? And we're hearing stories all over the spectrum because we said this violence was not an option and we didn't wanna listen. And if you take one thing away, it really was quite amazing. And another thing I learned was, you know, we think that, okay, we're gonna take all these different groups and bring them into our playground. But inclusion is not bringing people into what already exists. It's making a new space. It's making a better space for everyone. And, uh, you know, Tony, I sit on a couple of boards with Paris Sport Ontario and we run some tournaments. It's amazing when you include people, how much fun they have, you know, because once again in Canada, the only game in town. So that's just the start of it and, and really, you know, our medium uh, to long range plan in 10 months is to build really a, a long-term strategy which supports overall diversity and inclusion, a culture theme in our entire organization. And PGA, we wanna be the leaders because the only, only organization in, in Canada, unfortunately, right now that's, that has, uh, had, has this task force up and running. And we actually want it for the entire sport. So we want a strategy and that's our main plan in the next 10 months. Yeah, a, a couple of fantastic messages there, Kevin. Um, you know that really we can all take away understand what those needs of inclusion are don't assume don't assume they're uh, they're what we think they are <laughs> let's uh, put ourselves into into other people's shoes and uh, and make it a new space i think you know a couple of fantastic initial thoughts and and i think um sharing your findings with with other pgas is going to be as in as in many of the things around this congress so important um Jackie, I'll come back to you. I hope you, you're not the first to have fallen foul of technology during these few days, but delighted you're back. Um, I'm, I'm 
I'm going to just um, just move back to the Women in Golf Charter and, uh, you know, uh, something that you've been um, passionately driving over the last few years. Do you want to just explain a little bit and, and also then and talk about its impact so far? Yeah, certainly. So the, the, the charter we launched in, in 2018 and really the, the purpose, so the overarching purpose was to try and unite the, the golf industry and was to bring everyone together to, with a, a sole focus on increasing women and girls participation in golf, but also um, the, the number of women working in golf or having a, the opportunity to pursue a career in golf. And to date we've um, over 400 signatories. Uh, 60 of which are our national federations, um, a number of which are, are PG, uh, PGAs across Europe. And as you've said, Ian, a number of the uh, uh, European PGAs have, have now signed up as well as further afield. So that's, that's really um, encouraging. And I think one of the, the, the key things that we're starting to see is that um, organisations are, are able to shout a little bit about what they're doing, um, because again, we're in golf, we, we tend to downplay some of the good work and some of the success that we do have. So, you know, it's about celebrating what organisations are already doing. And it's also about looking forward and, and what actions and what commitments can each organisation make to try and commit to and support that overarching aim um, of encouraging more, more women and girls in, in the sport and in the, the workforce. And I'm, I'm delighted that you know we have a, a quite a range of organisations involved where we, you know, as the RNA are delighted that the number of federations that, that have come on board. And we are starting to see some traction um, and some impact and there's, there's some good work being done. Some of the work that we're really concentrating on this uh, next period of time is around clubs um, and trying to get more clubs to embrace change, um, to perhaps shine a, a mirror up and, and look at what they, they, they could do differently. Um, We've launched um, our For Everyone campaign, and um, like Kevin mentions the, the, the term quite a, a little bit there, and, and it is, it's about, yes, we're, we're starting, um, and the focus is on gender, but it is about celebrating golf as being a game for everyone. Um, and that the first part of that is really to try and support clubs um, in embracing some change and getting them ready rather than just trying to bring consumers to the sport we want to to try and, uh, and support golf clubs with a number of toolkits and resources that can really help and we're pleased that you know the, the pga is involved as well and um we hope that uh in the not too distant future um that we will be rolling that out uh, internationally across our jurisdiction as well yeah, and so um you know we that will rely on a number of PGA members uh, to, to also get on, on board and, and to help and support that, that process and that campaign. Yeah, no, thanks, Jackie. And I know we've been pushing hard and we've got seven PGAs from our membership lined up. I, I'm hoping again during 2021 we'll get many more. And uh, as much as signing up, it's it's actually doing something with it. It's really activating it is, is the key. And, and now you're taking a more proactive approach to giving giving tools where really people can um, implement them. Um, I, and I guess that's the next phase now. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, I think there's a really good example where um, the PGA of Canada have worked very closely with Golf Canada and they're trying to encourage more female coaches um, and supporting them to actually uh, develop as coaches and to develop as performance coaches. And I think, you know, initiatives like that, you know, they, they may not seem like they're, they're huge, um, massive campaigns, groundbreaking, but they are making a huge difference. Um, and collectively, if we can each take um, some action to, to to do that then we will see we, we will see change and I mean as you've said your you know your your membership figures have gone up um, and that's over a relatively short short uh, period of time and I guess it's about shining a light on some of these initiatives that different organizations are doing we need to celebrate the success and we need to um, highlight some of the the women that are out there doing um, some working in golf and actually enjoying the sport and playing the sport yeah, and Annika is certainly helping. Um, nice to see her becoming president of the IGF last week and got Anthony on the next panel, so we'll talk about that more then. But I'm going to shift because um, I know Susie's quite time, tight for time today and I know you've got to leave us at half past, um, Susie. Um, I'd like to shift to, to uh, coaching 
and the role of the PGA Pro, so how the individual can make an impact as well. And that's across all areas of um, diversity and inclusion. We had, I, I was at a, um, a meeting of the emerging nations in Europe last week with the European Golf Association, and the Latvian representative said, we've got our first female professional. It's made a massive impact, and it was really nice to hear oh. that. We've been supporting the, um, the Love Dot Golf, which I know they're using in uh, you're using in Canada as well. Yep. Um, just on an individual uh, element, Susie, what can you know the PGA Pro in any country really bring to this this whole campaign, this whole movement um, in diversity and inclusion? Yeah, well, I, it's so fun to, to hear what other PGAs are doing uh, around the world because I think we all learn from each other. And certainly here in the States, we've learned from PGA Canada in regards to long-term athletic development. We've instituted a PGA.coach uh, website for all of our PGA professionals to help train them in long-term athletic development, ADM, uh, is that particular process, which has some inclusionary um, ideas, uh, some, some games, uh, how, how coaches can be more welcoming, not only to disabled youth, but to youth that perhaps has autism or, or other uh, concerns that the family may have about those youth. And, and we want to ensure, as Jackie mentioned, that the facilities are actually prepared, that coaches feel confident uh, in their skills to deliver that. You know, PGA coaches, um, it's intimidating uh, on your first go when uh, somebody comes up perhaps and has lost limbs and you've never had the opportunity to be trained in that discipline. So we're doing a really concerted effort through our PGA HOPE programming to train our PGA professionals who, who want to learn more about disabled golf, uh, about youth, uh, uh, those with autism. We're partnering with the Ernie Ells Association uh, on his education program to help our PGA professionals to deliver that. But also it's just the fun uh, uh, for coaches and enjoyment in ensuring that their programming is packed. And we want PGA coaches to uh, make a living, uh, to be able to take care of their families. And so we've also partnered with Retail Tribe here in the States and a gentleman named Will Robbins to help our coaches develop coaching programming uh, that is beneficial to not only their facility, but to them personally, but also to those taking those programs and a couple of examples um, that we use here where, where I work is we do a coaching corner once a week. It's an outreach to membership to ensure that we're connected to them on a daily basis. What I think is key uh, during these times, during COVID, is that communication piece. Making sure it's substantial, not overdoing it, um, but really speaking to everyone in that piece. So very aware of the imagery that we're putting in our programming pieces that's going out. Uh, very aware of the dialogue, making sure there's no unconscious bias in, in who we're speaking to as coaches. Um, and what we're seeing is great growth. Uh, we're also taking the time uh, to pick up the phone again and to call people who we haven't seen at the club uh, in a period of time, not only to check on their health and their wellness, um, but to invite them to be a part of a group, to introduce them to others at their same level. Um, because what we've not done a very good job of, at least I can speak for myself personally, I shouldn't speak for all PGA professionals, is really connecting people um, that I coach uh, to go out together, to experience the joy of the game together, to love getting better together, to love missing together, um, and just enjoying golf. But it's very hard to enjoy golf when you're new uh, and you're by yourself. And I think, you know, if we could take a little from tennis, uh, tennis puts people on teams, tennis puts people together immediately when they join a club. Uh, so there's an instant group of people they can enjoy their time with. And I think if we do a better job of that as coaches here in the States, uh, we'll see great growth amongst new players. Um, but we can't forget our core constituent, our best customer. And as we navigate these times, we also have to ensure uh, that we're offering great programming for them because they're playing more golf and they want to play better golf. And we all know people spend more money uh, when they play more golf and better golf. Uh, so that's really a long answer. I apologize for the long-winded answer, but um, here in the states, we're really we're really purposeful in in what we're trying to do. As our customer, their needs are first, and we're trying to cater to that and their time now instead of vice versa. No, it's a, it's a great answer, and I think a, a theme that again has run throughout the last couple of days is you know PGA pros sometimes over-focused on technique. 
when actually the social element is so important, the, you know, the other elements of being a PGA pro are so important, the inspiring people to play the game is really at the core of what you are as PGA pros. I'll certainly take this forward and chat with Seth and the, and the staff at HQ and try and steal as many of your ideas as we can for the, uh, for the other PGAs to benefit from. Um, Tony, um, Tony, I know that you, you've been involved in um, looking at how um, you know, coaches adapt and, and be trained uh, in order to, to deal with different circumstances. Um, and again, we've worked with you on that and we'll continue to. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, the vast majority of golf professionals, have, obviously, we don't need to train them how to coach, you know, how to coach. What they need to know, perhaps, is a few of the specifics. And you're going to get a few different kind of populations that are coming to you with people with different disabilities. Susie mentioned autism is a good example of that. Somebody in a wheelchair. So, you know, you've got somebody in a wheelchair. How does ground reaction forces work? You know, if that's kind of where, where people are thinking. So I, I guess that, you know, it, what it does is it means that there's... Um, there's, there has to be a focus on making sure that the person that you've got in front of you drives the coach to get better. Because every time I was, I've been a coach for many, many years, and every time I've made any kind of breakthrough, it's because the person that's been in front of me has asked me a question either, maybe not, not physically asked me the question, but because of what they're doing and because I don't have the answer, they've asked me a question to go away and learn something else, go and figure it out and then come back and try and help me. And so I guess what we've tried to do is put some of these things that are very common. So, you know, somebody rocks up at your golf club on one leg or with one arm or that's blind or in a wheelchair or, as you, as you mentioned, as I say, autism or with another kind of intellectual disability and a whole myriad of other kinds of disabilities as well, I must say. What, what are you going to face? because it's just a question of making sure that you kind of desensitize the, the coach so that they're not always walking on eggshells to say the right thing. You know, oh, I've got to be careful what I call this person, what I say. Just do what you normally do, but make sure that you, you keep in mind that, that individual in front of you is a human being. They've got their wants, they've got their needs. Go satisfy them in the best way you can. So, yeah, what we did is we kind of flipped on, the, on its head some of the coaching uh, philosophies and we started to speak to the players and said, OK, how do you do this? How do you play? So we speak to our, our players that played on lead leg and then some of our players that play on trail leg. And we say, OK, what do you face? What, what are the difficulties that you have? Now, normally, we'd probably be directing that from top down, whereas now we've said, OK, well, let's find out what these guys face. Now we'll pass that to the coaches and say to the coaches, now, what do you need to know in order to be able to deal with this better? And that then passes it up to the educational issue now and try and figure out a program for that. So we're working with a, a university in, in uh, New Zealand uh, to try and do something on that. We're working with a university in the UK, uh, Durham University, where I'm, where I'm studying. And so, yeah, we, we've got a number of different places that we're working to try and make sure that we have a very rounded program. And I guess the, the payoff to that is that when your member who's 60 years of age comes along and says, well, I've got a bit of a dodgy knee, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure I can make this move. If you've already taught somebody who doesn't have a knee, then it's actually quite easy. So I guess it really helps our coaches to become better coaches. It certainly helped me to become a better coach, that's for sure. Yeah, and something we'll work with you to include in, in PGA programs and the PGA framework moving forward. I know everybody's tight for time, we're tight for time. Susie's had to had to drop out, um, but um, thank you very much for her input. I'm gonna, we've got, I think we've got another five minutes or so, um, and then we can't keep Mr. Nicholas waiting, but um, uh, Kevin, if you've just, if you had to give one piece of advice to PGAs and one piece of advice to PGA professionals about what they might, the steps they might take to, you know, really progress this and really make a difference, uh, what, what, what might they be? You know, I think the first thing is, you know, you've got to be mindful that the biggest thing we're going to have to educate our members, right? Because we have in our, our training academy, we have a course that says, you know, diversity and inclusive course. And believe me, when you take it, when I take it, I think, you know, besides Frank, I think I'm the most inclusive person, you know, in the room sort of thing. But when you take the course, 
you find out like we've been talking about the microaggressions, you know, sort of the intentional, you know, we think that we know what the person needs sort of thing. It's about educating our members on, you know what, take a step back and you've got to learn, learn, learn. And that was the biggest thing for me. I, you know, I've, I've been dealing for years with, with, with every population in Canada, but not until you look at yourself with the lens. If you're going to have a task force, be it large or small, it can't be, once again, what your PGA looks like. It has to look what your country looks like. So we have 17 people in our task force. I bet there's four who are members. And we have transgender. We have, you know, we have people of all abilities. You know, we have BIPOC. We have um, disabled golfers. I'm telling you. And we don't have the, you know, 55-year-old white male on, on the diversity inclusive because we're overpopulated already. So you've got to, I want our PGA to look like our country. And therefore, we're identified our priorities, our new Canadians for everyone in the room. You should, you know, identify the new immigrants, right? Golf and school programs are so important. People of different abilities, as Tony knows, wow, that has grown, uh, you know, uh, leaps and bounds. Women, we've talked about. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Susie. And the LGBTQ, you know, I2S community, and also socioeconomic status. You know, I think in in you know, we have first T in, in in America, but really, how do people go to golf if they're from the inner city, sort of thing? So those are just some priorities. But the first thing I would say is, if you're going to get a committee, make sure it's a very diverse committee because you're going to get some real truth in that, right? And the other thing is. And I, 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 I'm willing to give this to everyone free, as you know, I always do this. We have, which I think, and of course we didn't write it, we have the experts. We have a diversity and inclusive, uh, you know, education platform. So if any PGA would like that, you know what? I hope Matt Allen's not on because he'll yell at me, but Matt will send that to you. And I mean that sincerely. And that's, and that's just the way baby steps. I know we've got to start baby steps, but we'd love to help. Yeah, uh, a couple of good points again. Edu make sure you educate yourself because you might think yep. you know it all, but you don't. Uh, make sure you're educated and um, and look at your task force and uh, make sure you got the right people who understand it on that task force right. to, to make a change. So yeah, points well received. I'm going to ask the same question to you, Jackie. And if, um, where can we make sure that you know one achievable thing that individuals and organisations can do to make a difference? I think um, if I can relate it back to, to coaching um, in terms of the, the audience today, I think the, the whole um, important piece is around that customer experience, that valued experience, not necessarily how much it costs. And I think quality coaching is, is fundamental to part of that, pro that experience. Um, We've already talked about making it fun, making it social, um, reducing the, the, you know, not necessarily the technical input. But when we've seen such a, an upsurge in membership in this last period of time, um, one, one thing that is on the minds of many federations and, you know, conversely, PGAs, is that um, we need to retain these these mem these new members and these new people who have come to golf. And again, I think part of that is, is around that whole experience, which includes that quality coaching. Perfect, thank you. Um, Susie, same question to you before we wrap up. And then I'll give you your chance, Tony, after that. Yeah, I lost you for a little bit there, so I hope I'm not being redundant. But you know, the one thing I do want to share that has been incredibly successful in the States is a program that we have for our workforce, which is called PGA Lead. And we started PGA Lead in 2016. We're now in its fifth year. Um, and what that program is, it's for our PGA professionals who want to be talented, trained in governance, uh, in board, in being a part of task force and being a part of a committee system where we go out and they actually apply to be a part of this program. Um, since its inception, we now have 50%, 50% of those participating in PGA lead are now on either a national committee, a chapter board, which we have chapters in, in states, as well as sections, 41 sections in the states. 50% of those are now in representation. And that's women, uh, people from diverse backgrounds, people of uh, different sexual orientation, um, and so people disabled. 
Um, we are incredibly pleased uh, with the amount of applications we're receiving for those who want to be a part and step in. But I do think for um, the advancement uh, of all PGAs in inclusion, representation has to come from the top. And while I've had amazing mentors that are male, and I credit them with so many of the opportunities I've received, there are many in the field that look to what your boards look like, to what your committees look like, to determine if it's a place for them, to determine if they would be actually included and welcomed. And when you see somebody that looks like you, whether you're male or female or black or white, it certainly is far less intimidating to be a part of that group than to be the only one. And I think we have to, as a global entity, realize that we have to make a seat uh, for people that don't look like us in the room um, so that we can have a differing perspective, uh, a, a different place where people come from, uh, different ideas, because it's then that your governance system actually really caters to all. And it makes such better decisions. The group itself, um, when there's more differing aspects coming to that table, I found, at least here in the States, that when we had four women in the boardroom versus just one, um, really the perspective changed keenly on, on many decisions. And, and those four women aren't always going to agree, um, but they're always going to bring a little different perspective to the table. The same for somebody of color, and the same for somebody from Iowa versus New York City. Um, so I just think if, if we can offer anything at the PG of America of what's truly making a great impact in our oh. boardrooms and our committees. It's it's our PGA lead program. Yeah, no, thank you, Susie. Tony, I'm going to ask you to kind of we'll then draw things to a close. One question I'd like to ask is how much emphasis are you putting on golf and Paralympics, particularly in your role in IGF? Um, and then secondly, just you know, the same question to you. Well, to answer the first one, Paralympics, yes, I mean, it's, it's very important and it's something that we are definitely aspiring to do. I guess the, the most important thing for us is to get 500,000 people starting playing the game. That's a, an initial start. As I said, we, you know, we have a market out there of about 6 million people with disability that should be playing the game and currently are not. And so that's the first focus and, and we kind of call it a two-lane highway, if you like. The first one is about participation, getting these people playing. And then the second part is then about Paralympics. And clearly, it's something very important. And we, we were definitely taking steps to try and do that. Uh, we had a very important meeting that took place only a week ago. And uh, yeah, again, some, some really good positive things came out of that. And we'll start to roll those out over the coming months and years. So I think that's that, that hopefully that answers that bit on Paralympics. Uh, I think the, the second part is, is that I think we just have to realize that everybody's got a different perspective. If we don't ask them what their perspective is, then, you know, the world's just going to look like it looks through our lens. And, you know, Kevin's used that word on a number of occasions. That lens is really, really important. And I think the ability to be able to switch lenses and look through somebody else's eyes is not something that everybody has. I think it's something that we've got to try and educate people to do. And so I think that with the number of people out there that have got disability, the number of people out there that are of different ethnic minorities, the number of people out there from the LBGT community, the number of females and the number of, of, of males. I think when we look at it all, we, our game should look like the community in which we live. And at the moment, our game doesn't look like that. And that will hold it back. And if we want our game to really thrive, and I know, I, I fortunately, I listened to a couple of the, the sessions that you did, I think, on Tuesday. And um, one of the things was about thrive. So if we really want to thrive, we have to look like the community that we reside in. Because if we don't, the game will die. And that sounds very hard. But the reality is, is that if we look at global legislation that's out there now, we have to do this. Now, whether, whether the game wants to do it or doesn't want to do it is a, is a mute point. We're going to have to do this. Surely, we're better off being proactive rather than being reactive. And so I think this has been a fascinating panel. I've really learned a lot there from Kevin, Jackie, and Susie. And um, I just think that uh, we have to really take this, this matter very seriously. It is an important point, And I think we, we, we have to move forward together on it.
Yeah, no, thanks, Tony. I've really enjoyed it. I could have kept going for another hour at least, but unfortunately, time is against us, and uh, and we are looking forward to welcoming um, Jack Nicholas next, as as I said, you know, in the next five minutes or so. So, just to, to close things off, thanks so much. Lots of great messages, lots of actionable points, which is what we were aiming for. So Kevin, Jackie, Tony, Susie, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll see you all in a little while. Thank you.